Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to hear from three speakers, each with a long standing interest in due diligence laws in the supply chain. One speaker is an expert in responsible business conduct due diligence and has worked as a negotiator on due diligence at the OECD for garment and footwear supply chains. Another of our panelists is a senior member of a large global union headquartered in Europe with deep connections to unions representing workers in Asian garment and textile supply chains. And you'll also hear from a third guest, an industry leader in supply chain and sustainability initiatives for nearly 25 years across Asia, Europe, and the United, St uh, United States. And today leads a company providing a range of supply chain services. Three speakers from three very different backgrounds, but all united by the view that due diligence laws are not only increasing, but they're going to play an ever more important role in the relationship between buyers and producers. So welcome everybody to our first online seminar in a new series hosted by GIZ Fabric under the banner of Asian Dialogues on Sustainability in the Textile and Garment Industry and the thematic title of Moving the Needle, Creating the Future Together. My name is Stephen Frost and I'm your host today. I'll be back with our panelists in a moment and some general information on the WebEx platform uh, that you uh, that that we're all on. Uh, I'll explain some uh, housekeeping and uh, how to use the platform. Uh, but before that, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Mark Beckman, who is the project director for GIZ Fabric in Cambodia, uh, our official hosts, to officially start proceedings. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I would uh, very much like to welcome you on behalf of uh, GIZ, the German Agency for International Development and our FABRIC program. Thank you so much to all participants and especially also to our panelists for joining today. We really look forward to this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. So let me in the beginning really briefly introduce our program fabric and why we are hosting this new series of online seminars. Uh, fabric is a program funded by the German government, by the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's a regional program uh, working in six countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia and China. And the logic of our program is really that a lot of knowledge and experience exists in the region that can be used to address the main sustainability challenges in the sector. Um, so we are especially happy to have a lot of participants here uh, from the region. Of course, the main um, countries in the region are in a way uh, competitors. Um, but we also see um, and we feel that from our partners that there is a need and an opportunity to work together across country borders and to prepare the industry uh, for the future of sustainability. So in addition to regional dialogue, we are working very practically on the ground. And I just want to mention a few uh, practical examples. Uh, many of you might have um, seen this um, on the social media or might have even participated in our climate action trainings that we uh, developed as an e-training for producers um, to achieve the greenhouse gas reduction goals together. We are supporting workers in our partner countries through women cafes or, for example, smartphone apps to share information about the labor law. Um, and we are working, of course, as one of our key partners, the producer associations um, and their members uh, to improve um, purchasing practices and to make them fairer to, to all stakeholders. So the promotion of regional dialogue is very much at the heart of our approach. And as part of this, we have initiated the Asian Dialogues on Sustainability in the Textile and Garment Industry. Um, now, in the pre-COVID world, these were actual physical conference. This seems kind of like unbelievable now, uh, but we had actually uh, big regional events bringing together stakeholders from our different countries. Um, but while these physical conferences are, of course, uh, due to the pandemic conditions still on hold, 
um, the online seminar series Getting Through the Crisis Together that we launched last year in the face of the pandemic and its impact on the sector has reached an audience of more than uh, 2,000 uh, participants and I think more than uh, 10 seminars that we had organized. So now today uh, we are launching our new series, uh, Moving the Needle, Creating the Future Together, um, with the aim to contribute even further to regional dialogue. The emphasis of this series is looking at the road ahead. Many requirements and regulations are approaching the supply chain, some coming from Europe and the US, such as mandatory due diligence, or some coming from Asia on fairer uh, purchasing practices. Topics such as recycling, circular economy, innovation in fabrics and textiles and industry 4.0 are a key component on regional exchange to further to the to future proof the industry and move the needle towards more sustainability and healthy supply chains. So today we would like to address um, the topic of mandatory due diligence, a topic that, for example, in Germany has been um, discussed politically very prominently. As supply chains are extremely interconnected, these requirements are now coming from countries such as France, Norway, UK, Switzerland, the US, and as I mentioned, Germany, and of course are impacting business practices in Asia. So as this topic spans multiple supply chains, it also spans multiple actors that we have invited um, to the regional dialogue. Um, we feel that the dialogue is of crucial importance and today we warm you welcome to the first online seminar and invite you to be part of this conversation today and in future sessions. So again, thank you for sharing your time. Again, also really thank you um, to our panelists uh, for being here and sharing their knowledge and perspectives with us. Um, and I wish us all a fruitful exchange. Thanks and uh, back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Mark. Before I call on our first uh, speaker, our first panelist, let me deal with a few housekeeping issues. Um, first of all, this event is being recorded. I need to tell you that. And that recording um, will be made available to you afterwards. Um, this will be edited. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, technical people will uh, turn it into something watchable um, and you'll be sent a link for that. Uh, second, you are all in listen only mode. Uh, if you want to ask questions, and we certainly encourage you to ask questions, you should type them into the comments box. Uh, you'll see a chat button in the bottom right hand corner uh, of the WebEx platform that we're all uh, on today. Um, and you can just type into that box and I will keep an eye on them. Uh, and I will, uh, if questions, um, uh, you know, if you've got a question while someone is talking, um, and I, I think I can fit it in. I will, I will, I will put it into the discussion. Um, otherwise, uh, I will come back to questions that we haven't dealt with, and uh, deal with them at the end. We've got plenty of time for Q and A at the end. So uh, we want to make this a bit of a discussion, not just uh, people talking, talking, talking. Um, so uh, let's see how how that goes. If you've got a, uh, if if you're directing a question to a specific panelist. Please just indicate um, it's it's to a specific panelist, so I can really address the question to a specific person. A specific person, sorry. The objective of this event is to bring you the big picture view from Europe and the US on due diligence laws, but with a particular focus on what these new laws might mean for producers in Asia. Now, next week. Uh, GIZ Fabric is hosting a follow-up event, a part two, if you like, this is part one and part two next week, where we will focus exclusively on the German Due Diligence Act. Um, that particular law will be mentioned today, I'm sure, uh, but we, we're not going to discuss it in uh, excruciating depth. If you're particularly interested in the German Due Diligence Act, then the next online seminar is for you. Today is really just um, alerting people to uh, perceptions on how these new due diligence laws um, may play out, what to expect in the future, et cetera, and so on. So now let's go to our speakers. I'm, I'm going to throw the first question to 
uh, Jennifer Shepard, a partner at Due Diligence Design. Now, Jennifer has a background in policy design and government engagement. She was a co-author of the OEC Due Diligence Guidance for Responsible Business Conduct. She was lead negotiator of the OECD Due Diligence Guidance for Responsible Supply Chains in the Garment and Footwear Sector. Uh, she's worked with the European Commission, with the EU Parliament, uh, and the US, and key markets, including China, India, and Vietnam. So a, a huge amount of experience over the last decade in this topic. So welcome to you, Jennifer, and thank you for taking the time uh, to take over at the last minute from a speaker uh, who was advertised in an earlier brochure who met with an unfortunate incident over the weekend and is unable to be with us today. Um, our thoughts uh, are with Robert and I hope he's on the mend. Jennifer, you're an expert in due diligence. Um, how did we get where we are today? And, and what I mean by that is this. Oversight of human rights in supply chains has been a mostly voluntary activity. Fashion brands and retailers either did it or they didn't, but things are really starting to change. Can you just get the ball rolling for us by providing a sense of why you think things are changing now? And then secondly, to walk us through a bit on what the global landscape looks like with regards to uh, mandatory due diligence. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, and hello to everybody. It's a very much a pleasure to be on this call with you this morning. Indeed, we're talking about mandatory due diligence today. Maybe it makes sense to just step back for a moment and make sure we're all understanding what we mean by due diligence in general, because the term due diligence can be has been used previously uh, for, by companies and it, generally in a legal sense around bribery and corruption and other issues. And when it comes to what we're talking about today, it has a slightly different uh, meaning. So when we're talking about due diligence and mandatory due diligence, then we're really referring to the processes that companies are going to be required to take or are requiring, required to take in order to identify, to prevent, to mitigate, and to address labor, environmental, and governance issues uh, to people and to society. So previously, sometimes when we were talk, when if you're used to the term due diligence, it was often about the risk to the business. And in this case, you're looking at risk to uh, to workers, to the environment, or to society. So just to start with that, to make sure we're all on the same page. Indeed, uh, Stephen, you're absolutely right. To date, most uh, and and this sector knows this very very well. To date, most activity in this sector around environment and labor has been around voluntary initiatives. And that has had benefits for this sector in the sense that I think the sector has been leading across uh, many in comparison with many other sectors and driving really responsible practices on certain issues. And it also has a lot of um, detriments in the fact that it's been voluntary because we've seen a real um, uh, clash in terms of the diverse expectations that are being posed on on businesses. So the the multiple auditing schemes, the multiple industry schemes, the multiple um, initiatives, and we know that that's a huge burden that um, that the sec that the manufacturers have had to bear. The shift towards legislation has been one that may seem like it's coming out of nowhere and it's only sprung up in the last two years. But the ball has actually been rolling for about the last 10 years. And it's just that right now we're seeing the flip towards legislation is actually being on the agenda. So previously, what we had seen is that there were a few countries that had legislation for uh, companies, and this would be predominantly for the sector brands and retailers that are operating in their in their jurisdiction on very specific issues in the supply chain. So, for example, the US had legislation for conflict minerals or minerals sourced from conflict affected areas. Very, very specific, very niche issue. Uh, the UK had developed, and that was 2010. The UK developed legislation for bribery and corruption that extended jurisdiction of what happens if bribery and corruption is outside of the UK. And they then developed legislation on forced labor. So, once again, national legislation and very, very specific issues. What you're seeing now is the turning point 
where we are looking at two things happening in parallel. On the one hand, you have more national legislation. So this is something that uh, producers on the call should be really aware of. There's much more national legislation that's being developed. And so we have legislation now in the UK, in France, in Germany, in Norway, and also being discussed in the Netherlands and elsewhere. And then at the same time, we have EU level legislation coming in. And that's that's a game changer for the sector because the EU legislation is going to be relevant for all companies that are operating within the EU, not just EU based companies, but any company that is selling in the EU is going to be mandated by this legislation. So that's that's one of the major shifts. The other major shift in legislation is that it's moving from a very, very specific issue, specific um, type of legislation, forced labor, uh, bribery and corruption, to covering a process, to being a process legislation. And what that means is that companies are being asked to carry out due diligence on any labor, and in this case for the EU, environmental and potentially governance risks. So it's no longer specific to one issue, it's covering a broader range of issues. I think it might be useful just to flag at a high level what's included in this type of legislation and what will be new for the sector and what maybe you can already rely on what you've been doing. So in terms of what's included in the legislation, very much um, companies are going to need companies that are operating in the EU, so many of your, um, if you are a buyer or retailer, you, you as a company, if you are a producer, potentially your clients, will need to be able to justify that they are focused on their most severe environmental and labor risks in their, in their supply chain. So that's one. Second, they will need to be able to show that they're carrying out assessments of their most severe risks. Now, that's something that's not going to be that new for the sector because you've been carrying out um, factory level audits and assessments for, for decades now. Um, that's not going to go away. And that's something that you can rely on. Hopefully those will become more harmonized. I know we all want that, but that's still, a, that will be something that you can use to demonstrate uh, compliance with the legislation. What will be new to the sector and what we're calling maybe game changers for the sector are let's say five things. We'll just, I'll just go through them quickly. One is that the focus is shifting on just the assessments and the audits to really being able to demonstrate that you have policies and measures in place to actually prevent and to mitigate the issues that are being found. So if there is an environmental risk uh, or a chemical, um, a risk of certain types of chemicals that are in the production process, it's not just about assessing for them, but actually showing that there's the systems in place to prevent and mitigate them. Um, if there's potential risks around freedom of association violations. It's not just about understanding what those risks are, but actually demonstrating that there are policies and processes in place to prevent those, um, those, those breaches of compliance. So a big focus on actually prevention and mitigation. A second game changer, I think, for this sector is that there's a, a really strong focus on grievance mechanisms. Now, as business, um, those of you that have that have factories, you obviously have grievance processes within your factory uh, where, where complaints can be raised and you can handle them. What this is going to be looking at is how is one step higher. So how can a brand or a retailer actually hear complaints that are coming through through first handled at a factory level, but then potentially escalated to the brand and retailer? Uh, there's there's a benefit to this in that you want um, systems in place to be able to handle disputes in an effective way. Both manufacturers and workers always, always, always want to be able to handle disputes in a way that's timely and effective and um, addresses the issue. The point that you might want to look out for is that it can be challenging if there are numerous grievance mechanisms going on at the same time and um, a brand it, you as a factory have five different grievance mechanisms that you're needing to, to demonstrate in your factory because you have five different major brands that are sourcing from you. And this is where being prepared for the legislation in advance and thinking ahead and saying, 
okay, if we need to have these processes in place, how do we do it at a sectoral level? So that's another uh, key point. I'll go through the others faster. Um, stakeholder engagement is potentially a major part of forthcoming EU legislation. And this is looking at how does it stop being a top-down approach of brands dictating to suppliers their terms, and rather how are workers involved in, um, in designing processes and how are manufacturers design involved in that process. Another potential game changer that you should know about is whether or not legislation is going to cover just uh, direct contracts, so uh, buyer buyer or, or intermediary and manufacturer, or whether it will look upstream to fabrics, um, to, to processing, et cetera. If it does look further upstream, there will likely be a greater emphasis on you as a sector to start ensuring that that mapping and that information regarding those upstream value chains can be passed down. So that's another thing to just be aware of and to start um, looking at the processes around, which I know many of you are already doing. The last, last point I wanted to mention in terms of implications is that one of the leadership qualities of this sector is of the garment sector, from my experience, is that you do have, in some cases, sectoral initiatives that allow for um, a harmonized approach. I, I mean, I know that the, the Bangladesh Accord is often referenced, um, and now the uh, now it has obviously shifted to the RSC. So the RSC will refer to it in Bangladesh, where you have a whole sectoral approach with the BGMEA, with trade unions, and with brands to sectorally address um, fire and building integrity. That's an approach that can be recognized likely by EU legislation and that reduces the individual burden on a, on, a, on a factory and the individual burden on a brand. And so already thinking through uh, the fact that legislation is coming and how those sectoral approaches can be put in place to address known, known risks that exist um, collaboratively is, is probably going to be a smart way to uh, to prepare for this legislation. I'll stop there. Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. That's, uh, yeah, what I, I heard a lot of things there, but one of the things I really heard was be prepared. Um, you know, uh, start on this uh, ASAP um, to get yourself in a position uh, to be able to benefit from it. Um, I'm going to move straight on to our next guest, um, Alki Bolsinger. Um, Alka is the Deputy General Secretary of the Uni Global Union, um, headquartered in Europe, headquartered in Switzerland. Um, Alka has worked for Uni for much of her life, trade unionist, has held many different responsibilities in different departments and sectors within uh, this very large union. Uh, her trade union roots are in Germany. She's been head of uh, ICTS and Uni Commerce. And she and uh, the union, Uni, Global Union, are strong advocates of mandatory due diligence across the European Union. So look, thanks very much, Alki, for being with us today. Um, I know your time is short and you need to leave before we finish up this, uh, uh, this, this webinar. So can I just ask any participants that have a specific question for Alka, can you, can you please write them into the chat box as, uh, as she's talking and uh, I'll try and um, ask them to her at the end. So I just want to start off then by by asking you um, a very broad question. So Uni Global Union has been a long time advocate of laws to ensure European companies have a legal responsibility for ensuring safe decent union Indian fashion resellers and brands with Asian supply chains be doing right now to prepare for laws already in place or for, as Jennifer says, coming soon. You know, what are your expectations? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for um, that question, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to, to speak to you today. And really, let me start by saying that um, 
what we're asking all brands and retailers, not just those that are based in Europe to do, is to undertake human rights to diligence, which goes beyond a tick box exercise, beyond a unilateral exercise. What we want to see are mechanisms which are effective at preventing problems from arising in the first place. And uh, I'm very grateful to Jennifer for the summary that she has uh, given us because um, I realized that pretty much all that she outlined that is going to be included in the European legislation are actually uh, reflections on the demands that we have put in and which are based on the experience that we have. We work with more than 100 multinational employers uh, on their human rights practices. We've signed global framework agreements which secure key labor rights with almost 60 companies all across the services sector and including multinational retailers. And we have in several instances also successfully enforced the due diligence guidelines for multinational enterprises of the OECD. And through this practical experience, um, we've identified three key areas, um, which I can go uh, into more detail uh, about later on if there is interest. And they're very uh, much compatible with what Jennifer explained in her introductory remarks. The first one is, the importance of freedom of association and collective bargaining as a salient human rights and the need for due diligence and transparency on outcomes of this. The second one is the necessity of meaningful trade union engagement throughout the entire process. And the third one is the need for board level management and robust enforcement of the diligent processes. Now, from our point of view, for the due diligence to be effective, trade unions at local and international level must be involved in the entire process, from identifying and mitigating the risk to remedying when problems occur. And uh, as Jennifer mentioned, there are strong examples of how this can be effective. She mentioned the Bangladesh Accord, or now the RSC, where uni has been uh, involved right from the beginning. Um, and now with the International Accord, we're planning to take this experience that we have had with Bangladesh and expand it also to other countries. And we're encouraging all brands that are sourcing from Bangladesh to join us in this effort because the, the ambition that we have with the RSC is really to make this an initiative that covers the entire um, industry in the country and also for brands to support our international expansion there. Um, the rights of freedom of association and collective bargaining are often at risk or not respected in parts of global operations of companies or in their global value chains. But still companies fail to include this particular risk in their due diligence when they're deciding to source from a particular country or to expand their operations. And in addition, the right to join a union or to bargain collectively serves as a an important enabling right so that workers can effectively safeguard their wider human rights. For example, the right for health and safety, for living wages, for uh, anti-discrimination and so on. In that way, having a union and collective bargaining is in our, from our point of view, one of the most effective ways that human rights in general can be protected on an ongoing basis. And finally, it's, uh, essential, we believe that due diligence activ activities are integrated into the core business strategy and that the company board must have oversight of the design and the implementation of the company's uh, human rights due diligence. It's not, uh, it's not practical to have it just assigned to the C a CSR department or to a buying department. We need top level decisions. It needs to be part of the entire decision making process in the company and they're applicable. Uh, supervisory boards should also be involved in the oversight um, uh, of this process. Now, uh, Jennifer mentioned um, the, the grievance mechanism, and I would again refer there to the um, now RSC in Bangladesh, where we, I think, have built one of the most credible and uh, uh, most respected complaints mechanism um, that can be used by all uh, members of this tripartite organization, by workers, by uh, the, the industry, and by, uh, by brands. And it's a very, very uh, solid and robust example of when you have a credible mechanism, how it is also being widely used. And we see that when we look at the numbers all the time, and where we see how workers have uh, begun to trust such a mechanism and help 
both the factories and the brands to improve their own internal processes to make sure that um, issues are being identified early and um, are also being remedied. Now, through all of our work with the multinational companies, we have precedent of how companies and trade unions can work together to mitigate uh, risks to these rights. Um, and I'm be happy to talk about more practical examples later on or answer any questions that you may have on these issues. So I think I'll leave it here for now. Thanks, Stephen. Let me unmute myself. Look, Alka, one of the one of the, uh, there's a question come in. Actually, it's for it's for Jennifer, but but also listening to you where you finished up talking about grievance mechanisms. Someone's asked, um, how do you make a grievance mechanism effective in factories in Asia? Um, knowing that there are other grievance mechanism solutions in those factories. I think that's, that's kind of a question. Well, how do you how do you make these effective on the ground? Have you can you talk to that? So I, I can give you two different examples. I can maybe just okay. briefly outline why the mechanism in the Bangladesh court is so, uh, or the, the RSC now is, is so effective, but I can also give an example from how it works in a particular company that we have a global agreement with. So in the RSC, I think what makes the mechanism so effective is that it is totally um, um, isolated and independent from the rest of the organization. So the complaints unit that we have that treats any complaints that are coming in um, is not reporting or managed by the rest of the organization. They're independent in their investigation um, of, the, uh, of the mechanism. And I think that's something that's very important, particularly to workers, who are most of the time the ones who are very very vulnerable in this in this entire process, and then we have a whole uh, process set out um, what follows an in initial investigation, who has to be informed, who has to be uh, participating. Of course, we're guaranteeing and um, that people can uh, remain anonymous; they don't have to put their name forward unless it's important for the resolving of, of the um, uh, of, of the issue. But by guaranteeing that people are really protected in their rights. Um, we have seen a massive increase in reports that we have received of issues because people have trust in the mechanism and they have trust in the process that we have built to, uh, to remedy um, uh, cases that are being uh, put forward. Now, another example I can give you is um, based on an agreement that we have with a French retailer, Carrefour. We've had a global agreement with them for many, many years. And Carrefour, um, about 15 years ago, um, bought a, uh, a local retailer in Colombia. Now, Colombia is a country, like some countries in Asia as well, which um, is not exactly known for its protection of human rights. And particularly, it's very dangerous to be um, either a social society uh, activist or a trade union activist in the country because they regularly get targeted by the paramilitary. Now, we uh, together, as the company was uh, uh, expanding in Colombia, we designed a program together, management and the trade unions to train both the local management in Colombia and the workers in Colombia about their, their rights, about our uh, expectation that they work together, that there are constructive relations that are being built. And with that, we formed a basis for, um, uh, for workers to feel free, free to, um, to form a trade union. And then as part of their trade union building and the collective bargaining that followed that, they developed their own local mechanisms for, uh, for a grievance mechanism where, where workers could uh, put forward their, their, their issues. And one of the things that happened was that as a result of this trust building between the two parties in Colombia, Colombia when some of the leaders actually received death threats from paramilitary squads in, uh, in Colombia, the, the company management and the trade union leaders together stood up, made public statements, denounced the, uh, um, uh, the incident to the police, and, um, and the, the, the death threat stopped and nothing happened. And I think it's particularly in countries where there is a high disrespect for workers' rights, including uh, threats for the life of people that are um, you know, standing up for others, it's very, very important that we have this joint action and this public action to protect um, the rights of, uh, of everybody. Yeah, well, as you're talking, um, I'm being bombarded with questions in the, in the chat box. Um, I'm going to try and round a few of them up. 
Um, uh, Matthew's asking, well, and someone else has uh, put in a question that's quite similar to Matthew's, you know, that in Southeast Asia, you know, in various countries, uh, unions are not created by workers. They're not, they're not bottom up uh, organizations. They're created either through legislation, um, you know, they're, they're top down. Um, and these unions could be breeding grounds for uh, for corruption, for not looking out for workers' interests, um, unions serving their own interests, um, unions that are um, a part of a political organisation. You know, they're kind of like an escalator to get the the political idea down into the working class roots uh, of a of a society, uh, and not necessarily have the the best um, outlook for workers. What do you, you know, where does the legislation and, and, you know, talking about due diligence, bringing it back to due diligence, is there anything that you see in the law that is going to start um, dealing with these sorts of things or, or you know, uh, you got any advice on those sort of questions? I know it's kind of a tough question, but these are the questions, right, from uh, this region. Absolutely. It's, it's a big concern for us as well, because, of course, our interest is to, to, to work with um, democratically established trade unions that are representative of the workers in the factories, in the industry where, where they're operating. Um, I don't believe that um, European due diligence legislation, for instance, is going to resolve that issue. Um, there is a lot of work that has to be done in each country in particular. And I think one of the uh, issues that we have identified in the countries where we work is that the lack of functioning labor inspection, the, the lack of proper enforcement of legislation is something that really works to the detriment of real democracy, worker democracy, or generally uh, a democracy of which trade unions are a part of. Now, it's not just trade unions that are representing political views. Employers do too, because there's a lot of lobbying going on. There's connections into government, into government or into parties that are uh, um, uh, operating in each country. So I think that's something that all of the different parties involved, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's, a no, it's a normal uh, part of, of, of our life and, and of, of running a business or of running your organization. But we are very, very firm on the issue uh, uh, of corruption. If we find out about uh, trade union leaders being corrupt, we will not work with them. Uh, we do a lot of training with our trade unions um, uh, in terms of making them understand what it really is that they're supposed to do in terms of uh, representing workers. We're doing a lot of work uh, in terms of um, actual organizing so that we have workers actually have real membership in these trade unions, because if you have real members, then you also have demands for democracy in a union. And then the workers want to uh, be part of the decision making of what the union does, what it stands for, what gets negotiated in collective negotiations. So we do a lot of political, uh, like basic training work uh, with, um, with uh, trade unions in Asia and in all parts of the world. Yeah, look, yeah these are these are tough questions. I, I know you've been working on these for many years, and if we had an easy solution, we'd, we'd have it already. Um, Jennifer, can I come back to you? Jennifer, you this this uh, this first question that I asked Alka was also for you. You know, how do you how do you make a grievance mechanism effective in in factories where uh, you know that there are other grievance mechanism solutions available in the factory? Did you want to have a shot at that? Sure. Uh, although I think Alka. I could probably explain okay, okay. that uh, in the same way I would, but just maybe just to reiterate one or two points and, and really had also some thoughts on that second question from the okay. EU perspective. So on the grievance mechanism, yeah, just to summarize Alka indeed, I think what you're looking for here is um, escalation procedures. So we're not talking and no, no one is talking about um, replacing a, an operational mechanism because at the end of the day, it's always better to handle complaints at the factory level um, that's under the ILO says that trade unions um, trade union dialogue between trade unions workers and management at the factory level is always the most um, the most appropriate and what everybody wants to see nonetheless it's always it is beneficial for manufacturers and for trade unions and for workers if there isn't a trade union to have a process that if a complaint can't be, handled, that it can be escalated so that it can be handled in um, an effective way. 
And this is something, uh, the two examples that Alka gave are, are, are perfect examples from the RSC and also through their complaints, uh, through the procedure that was developed in Colombia. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that, of course, it's always better to have industrial relations at a factory level where trade unions and manufacturers can sit at the same table to solve complaints in a in an effective way. One thing we learned when I was at ACT, which is an um, initiative, I was the executive director of ACT, is that the brand role in this, and it's important to be clear, is not to be the judiciary. Brands should not be the, the judge of this. To the extent possible, it should be manufacturers and trade unions negotiating and um, finding a solution together. That's industrial relations, and it's beneficial for both parties. The brand role can be just to play that um, to to play a role to ensure that that they are recognizing the outcomes of those agreements. So, if manufacturers and trade unions agree to reinstate, for example, workers that have been fired, and it's been agreed that they will be reinstated, the brand recognizes that decision. It's not their role to determine what the remedy is. Just to clarify rules. In terms of the FOA question, freedom of association question, um, of course, I am not representative of workers, ALCA is, so that is all, all uni there. But one thing we've learned in terms of what the policy, how you can think about preparing for the EU policy in this question around um, trade unions and freedom of association is, is, is start to get clarity at a sectoral and national level on what freedom of association means within the sector in a way that aligns with ILO labor standards. And so an example of this is that in Myanmar prior to February, um, there was a freedom of association guideline that was negotiated between manufacturers representing 80% um, of the export industry and, um, and brands representing 40% of the export industry and IWFM, which was the largest trade union body backed by Industrial. And they agreed jointly, what are our expectations for the respect to freedom of association in this country in relation to time off for trade unionists to do their duties, in relation to dismissal, really technical. And what that allows is that you don't have this divert, like diverse um, interpretations anymore. You have a common standard. It's very clear. It's very transparent. And that helps um, if you are able to start to negotiate those types of agreements. It means that when the law comes, you're just abiding by what you've already negotiated. There's not going to be new impositions on you. And you can demonstrate that you've already negotiated this with trade unions with brands, with, um, with buyers, or I mean, with manufacturers. Yeah, um, yes, thank you. Um, I just noticed in the chat box that uh, Yen Nguyen, uh, CNB, asked, when do you think the EU law on due diligence might be passed? Is there a roadmap? Yeah. And Lisa put something in the chat box, uh, a link in the chat box to responsiblebusiness.org, um, a roadmap to EU due diligence. Um, so anyone can mm. click on that link and download to get the answer to uh, Yen's uh, question. Um, thank you very much, Alke. I'm, I'm gonna move on to uh, Ian now. Um, Ian Spalding is the founder and CEO of Elevate. Ian has regularly featured as a speaker and a guest at major events, top tier media, outlets such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, CNN, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, prior to founding Elevate, uh, Ian worked at Sears, uh, KPMG, and BSR. I think it was back in the Sears days that I first bumped into yeah. Ian. Um, he was the director of global compliance, uh, where he pioneered what was the largest effort to promote greater transparency, continuous improvement among thousands of manufacturing facilities globally. So a lot of experience. Um, on the ground, look. So you've been in the CSR sustainability space for for 25 years, over two decades, 25 years, and and through your company Elevate, you you now speak to all all sorts of people in this in this space. So what sense are you getting from companies? And when I say companies, I mean mm. fashion brands and retailers. So you know, on one hand, the brands, the buyers, but also on the other hand, the producers, the manufacturers. Mm. Um, what kind of sense are you getting? Um, the talk or the chat about the rise of 
of the law in supply chains. Great, thanks, Stephen, um, and and it's great to see you again after so many years. Um, so thanks for also for the opportunity to share uh, the stage here. Um, I look, I, I have been working in this field for quite some time, and and a lot of this field of of having brands and retailers trying to address issues of supply chain risk uh, throughout the world have been largely driven by by public relations or fear of of being named and shamed. It's it's not been driven by legislation um, until recently. Um, and, and that's what I think is, is really interesting because a lot of our efforts over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, I think have, have not been as significant in terms of driving real impact, uh, the kind of impact that I think we would all expect. And I think we've all fallen short of, of, of where we think the industry could be in trying to protect workers and improve the environment. Um, but part of that is because I think a lot of companies have viewed these issues as uh, a, a kind of a, a tick the box uh, uh, due diligence exercise. And so they 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 build programs and, and, and we're involved in helping many of them improve them, but but nonetheless, they build programs that really are relying on, on very superficial efforts. Um, now, that is not true across the board. There are phenomenal companies that are very in, in, um, uh, uh, committed to drive real change for workers and, and within their supply chains and, and fundamentally change how they source, uh, which partners they select, and how to drive real impact and change. That is absolutely true, um, and we see it on the ground. But unfortunately, for far too many brands, retailers, and manufacturers, they have treated this field of due diligence or compliance or sustainability more as a tick the box exercise. Um, and, and I think that the laws that are emerging, um, uh, I give some hope, although I will caution everyone uh, that, that I've been working primarily with North American US companies for quite some time. And we've had laws on the books for a while that people have generally ignored. Uh, and, uh, and in the last few years, we, we now have a law that's been around for, for, for decades and decades that, that ultimately has now been enforced. And that, that's actually the, the law of U.S. Customs has uh, to prevent the importation of goods made with forced or child labor. It is rarely used up until two years ago. And now we see it used on a regular basis. Uh, in fact, just the last two weeks, two factories in, in Malaysia were, went through this withhold release order, uh, which uh, basically prevents them from getting access to the U.S. market, which has a significant impact on, on their business. That was not a new law. That was just a new interpretation of an old law. And, uh, and, and what I have seen is, is unbelievable in terms of the impact. Um, the fundamental changes in how companies respond as a result of that. So if the new emerging mandatory due diligence laws uh, have the framework that, that we heard from Jennifer and, and Alka, uh, great. But if it has no teeth, if it's not effective, if it's not real, then I think we're just repeating history here and ultimately having a lot of tick the box exercises for companies to build very superficial grievance systems, superficial audits that don't actually get at the critical issues. If, on the other hand, we take a page out of the Customs and Border Protection page of the U.S. government, and we actually use that power and leverage to apply to force companies to, to build robust programs that are effective and you know, scare the hell out of companies that, that you will not have access, you gotta get your lawyers, uh, because this, we're, we're taking this to court. Um, it will, in fact, force companies to up their game and mature their systems and make sure that grievance systems are effective to make sure assessment protocols are effective and understanding what the real issues are in, in some of these markets. And I'll just tell you, just in my own personal life, right, I've been involved in, in these issues for a while from Kathy Lee Gifford in El Salvador and Honduras with 14-year-old workers in factories to Saipan, where we had uh, foreign workers imported to produce garments for the U.S. market in, in a little island called Saipan, which had led to a billion-dollar lawsuit, to the suicides in Foxconn in Shenzhen and, 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 and Chongqing, uh, and then uh, to the Bangladesh uh, um, uh, Accord Alliance, uh, where we were on the ground following the tragedy of Rana to help the North American companies drive change. 
those tragedies and those incidents led to some reform and improvement. The question is, did it lead to sustained change, sustained improvement? And I think the jury is still out on a lot of that. Uh, but what I see happening with the legislation in the case of the U.S. Customs, uh, that enforcement mechanism is, is forcing companies to say, we have to up our game. We have to get professional auditors, not BSEI, not SEDEX, not tick the box, close one eye audits, but real professional in-depth forensic people who know how to get to the bottom if we're going to do due diligence. And we also have to make sure grievance lines, mechanisms for workers for recourse are there. And, and if trade unions are there and they are uh, at the table, of course, so be it. Uh, but often, as we know, in many of these markets, they're not there. They're not established in these manufacturing facilities. And as a result, it's not a recourse for workers today. And there has to be some other way that they can uh, uh, have a voice that often is respected and uh, and their rights can be protected. I'll just conclude with one reason to be hopeful because uh, over the last uh, 15 months, uh, Elevate's been involved in the verification of uh, the repayment of uh, recruitment fees for uh, several very, very large companies in, in the apparel sector, in the medical product sector, you know, in, in a number of different sectors in, in Thailand in Malaysia and Taiwan, you know, et cetera, where we have foreign workers. And uh, uh, and what we have seen is is uh, tens of millions of dollars that is actually being repaid back to workers. Uh, we're talking checks of $5,000, $6,000, $7,000, and fundamental changes to how recruitment is taking place, and even questions about migration and should we actually be employing workers from some markets because we, we don't have the right effective tools to prevent due diligence. And so recognition that maybe we need to think about upping the wages to deal to employ more domestic workers, uh, uh, direct workers, instead of relying on foreign workers in that. These are questions, these are discussions that, um, that were all hypothetical uh, a few years ago, but we see real movement there. And I think it all is coming from law, companies that are being subjected to uh, uh, U.S. Customs law that mandate real reform in their operations. Yeah, interesting. Um, Alka, I know you've got to go shortly, but I, I, I just something Ian said just uh, kind of got me thinking. Um, he said, "How?" Uh, he said, "If the law has no teeth." I'm just trying to read my uh, my handwriting right. If the law has no teeth, we may just find ourselves repeating history with another, you know, an, yet another framework that doesn't work. Um, and for those of us who've been around for a while, you know, we've we've, we've been through through this. So my question to you, and this is also to Jennifer as well, but you know, how likely are we with these uh, with uh, here with these upcoming laws to be in danger of repeating history. Is that likely? I'll start with Alki. What, what do you think? Because I know you've got to go. I, th I think what's what's important is, and both uh, Jennifer and I uh, refer to that in our uh, earlier remarks, is that the whole process of developing uh, due diligence in the company has to be an inclusive uh, process from beginning to end. Because if you have all the different players, all the different stakeholders involved in designing the actual uh, mechanism, then you have a much lower risk of actually missing risks or not addressing them, not be having a partner that you can talk to. And also you will have many, many pairs of eyes on how you're actually applying and implementing this process and how um, and, and to make sure that you actually get to the remedy stage. But I mean, from our point of view, what's really, really important is actually the part right at the beginning, which is risk analysis and designing a program that uh, makes sure that incidents don't actually happen, whatever they may be. May they be on health and safety, on, uh, on other human rights or labor rights violations. So if you have an inclusive setup where you have everybody involved, the risk of not having um, you know, something that has teeth is very, very low. Now, in addition to that, you know, 
the, the nature of European uh, directives is that then once we have that framework, it gets translated into national law in the different countries in the European Union. And each country will that interpret a slightly different early. You spoke at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the, um, of the German law that, that has just been adopted that's going to come into force in 2023. And there are many things that are good about that law, but there are also some shortcomings there in terms of access to remedy, particularly for victims. And our hope is that some of that is going to get fixed with the European uh, uh, directive that is that is being developed. So, but I think there are, we're seeing massive progress. I don't believe all of the issues are going to be fixed straight away with these initial laws that are coming out nationally or regionally for, for, for Europe. But I think it's going to be a massive step forward. And I think governments have a very, very big interest in making sure that these laws are actually like, successful. And the example that the Ian has given from the US, I think it's a very important one. And the questions I saw in the chat is that, yeah, but why is that, that we had this law for so long <laughs> and nothing happened with it? But I think there are so many eyes we've had seen uh, on these new legislations now that I have big, big doubts that they run into into nothing. Yeah. Jennifer, did you have anything to add to that? Or I saw you nodding your head. Well, I had two thoughts. I think there's two, I mean, completely agree, conversely. I think there's two uh, points of, uh, of pushing for an effective legislation. So at the EU level, the legislation is not finalized right now. The commission is writing right now a draft and then it's going to be negotiated. Um, so before the implementation, all of the articles are finalized and the implementation is decided, there's an opportunity to advocate for legislation that, that is builds on what is best practice. And I just wanna give a shout out actually to Fabric uh, who is hosting this because right now you're, you are leading obviously on the purchasing practices coming from manufacturers through STTI. And that's an example of where you as manufacturers have set what the baseline purchasing practice commitments are that you would like to see. Now, if legislation comes and includes purchasing practice commitments or purchasing practice expectations, there needs to be a way for it to recognize what you have already done. So in working towards um, the commission understanding what exists and what's effective is really important. You can't just presume that the commission knows the work that you've been doing. That's really important. The second point where you can help to make the legislation effective and not just a tick the box exercise is after it goes into place and it's being implemented, it's going to take a little while to work out to determine um, what companies are held liable to. So the liability will be set, whether it's administrative or civil, but it's still going to be the actual governments that review a case and determine whether or not the company has done due diligence. And at that point, um, we need to have more technical, I think, uh, standards or approaches that you together determine uh, as stakeholders on what you expect the government to use as their best practice that they're evaluating against. And this is where things like uh, the RSC is really important. So, so you're going to see the effectiveness come before in that advocacy, and you're going to see it come after as they actually interpret the legislation. And you have an option to to influence at both both levels. Okay, you've got to go in a couple of minutes, but have you got any last uh, words uh, for us all here? And, and then we'll let you go, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I hope it's not my forever last words, just the last words for this for, <laughs> for this for this event. Um, yeah, I mean, just to reemphasize what uh, Jennifer's just said, I, I outlined like the kind of three demand, the key three demands that we have, and we've done actually extensive work with our affiliates. We've submitted um, our uh, what our key demands are for European legislation. Uh, we've we've talked to unions in both the developing countries and in the European countries in terms of what needs to be in, included. And we've actually started developing training programs for um, in Germany, for instance, for um, for the works councils, for the trade unions, for supervisory board members, so that they're prepared to uh, get involved in this process of developing the uh, due diligence mechanisms together with the companies where, uh, where they work. So I think that's a very important role for us that we need to take on is this question of training and capacity building. Um, because it's not just a question of 
um, you know, the unions in, uh, in the sourcing countries is a big important question also for those in the countries where the legislation is being made. Um, because like in the German case, for instance, if, you know, if you are a, a victim of violation of your rights in a, in a sourcing country, you cannot, uh, uh, you know, take a company in Germany to court for that. You have to go through the stakeholders that you can work with uh, from civil society and trade unions in Germany. So this international network building, this cooperation, and these different tools that we have that I mentioned earlier on, the RSC, but also the global framework agreements and so on are going to be very important tools that are going to help both companies and workers um, to have credible mechanisms that represent a part of their due diligence system. So I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, look, thank you very much um, for your time. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, thank you. Um, let me get back to um, Jennifer. What role for Asian governments? Um, you know, we, we're talking a lot about the, the EU. Uh, we talk, uh, 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 Ian's uh, talked about the US. I'm going to come back to that in a, in a moment too. But what role for governments, you know, in the production countries? I think that governments in any, um, in, that are trading with any country that is developing these laws has a really important role because as a government, they have the responsibility to set the enabling environment within the country so that the responsibility isn't just falling on the businesses in that country. So there are very specific things that governments can do to help um, their businesses be well positioned in this new marketplace. Um, one is to, it's really obvious, but to make sure that legislation is aligned with, with ILO core standards, with environmental standards. And that is something that has been said for many years, but it's becoming more important because as companies are gonna be looking at risk profiles, um, just looking at that legislation in a new country is one of the first things they're looking at. So making sure that the, le the legal framework is in place. But then secondly, um, building the capacity of the government, and this is easier said than done, and I know many governments are working on this, but building the capacity of the government to actually carry out um, the technical inspection. So once again, it doesn't fall so much on the business to be doing that. And so that brands and retailers can rely on the inspections that are coming out of governments is, is obviously very important. Easier said than done. It can focus on specific elements first as capacity is built. And I know GIZ has been working with governments on this uh, in Cambodia and elsewhere. The third is making sure that those access to remedy mechanisms are in place, which means that you don't need to rely on um, sector mechanisms as much. In Cambodia, you have a, a brilliant um, arbitration council that can be used. So strengthening national mechanisms as the government is is obviously more effective and more preferable for everybody. So we don't have to rely on um, sectoral mechanisms. And then the last thing I would say is that a really interesting example is Vietnam, I think. Um, in the last years, Vietnam has been developing their industrial strategy. And so as they were thinking about how do we grow our sector um, from, a, from a commerce perspective, how do we grow our sector? They're also at the same time thinking about what legislation is coming. How do we build the capacity of our sector to meet that legislation, to meet these demands as they trade with Europe and to therefore capitalize on the EU free trade agreement that's going on? Right. So having that holistic perspective in an industrial strategy rather than um, a, a disparate strategy is important. Yeah. Let me go back to, to you, Ian. Um, for producers who are, you know, manufacturers, producers sitting here, uh, you know, on this call, um, what kind of advice do you have? You know, you've got um, the German Due Diligence Act uh, kicks in, comes into force uh, in uh, January 2023. So we've got 13, four, 13 and a bit months. What What kind of things do you think for a producer listening to this should be be starting to think of practically 
I think it's it's a good question. I mean, I think it's um, it could either be an incredibly scary conversation or it could be actually a very hopeful conversation. I mean, we all know the power dynamics are not with the manufacturer. They're with the retailer and the brand. They hold the purse string. They write the purchase order. They determine uh, which factories get the orders. And there's an oversupply of factories. Uh, there are, uh, even even in a you know difficult environment like we have now, right? We do not need 5,000 factories in Bangladesh, right? We do not need that. There's, so there's an oversupply. And and so you could view this as, okay, with, with the mandatory due diligence laws that come into effect, maybe the brand and retailer will be held accountable to do proper due diligence of the factories they work with so they won't replace me for the guy down the street who's cheaper because he doesn't pay his workers. So that's a good thing because we're creating a level playing field if we hold fact brands accountable for that. You could argue though, for those factories that fall below the, the threshold of performance, uh, then it's just a matter of time before they get caught out uh, and, and therefore their cost structure will have to change. We see that there was a factory just reported in the Malaysia um, news media uh, today a uh, factory that that produces for the electronics industry that ultimately was relying, according to the article, uh, uh, a heavy reliance on irregular workers. Basically, because of COVID, they couldn't get workers in the country. Uh, they relied on irregular, otherwise known as illegal, undocumented workers to do it. They often are cheaper than regular and domestic workers. In that scenario, they got caught out. They basically got shut down and they had to they had to limit the number of workers they could employ. Ultimately, their profits are down, their revenue is down, and their stock price is down as a result of all of this. So now in theory, they were they had a higher revenue and profit margin because they were relying on illegal workers uh, in their in their manufacturing base. And when everyone found out, it hurt their business. And uh, and so for them, how do you build a sustainable business that actually factors in the true cost of compliance, the true cost of employment, the true cost of immigration, uh, the true cost of recruitment fees that are often uh, in, in that analysis. And, um, and that could mean for some factories, uh, they're going to be worse off because they have lower margin, lower profit, and they may not survive because they've made, a, they've made their business by being the cheapest and exploiting those laws. Uh, so I think it's a mixed bag, and I think we don't know. Uh, it depends on ultimately how much teeth those laws have and 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 what brands and retailers do and whether they're serious about enforcement uh, uh, efforts. Yeah. What, Jennifer, do you have advice for for producers? I think Ian, um... Ian summarized summarized that quite well. Um, I guess the only other advice is that, fortunately, in this sector, you do have uh, some initiatives that are effective. I'm not saying all initiatives are effective, and I know as producers, you're bombarded by a gazillion initiatives, uh, but there are there are some. And what I think we'll see with the legislation, because we saw this with existing EU legislation, is that they will recognize effective initiatives as meeting the requirements of the legislation. So there is a rationale, therefore, to A, make sure that initiatives that are out there are actually effective and are not just tick the box. So strengthen them as, as all stakeholders involved in this call. And then secondly, to join them, because that's going to be an easier way to, um, to abide by the legislation. I mean, obviously, it's not about escaping your responsibility, but just recognizing that that's an approach that you can take and is probably a more effective one anyway. I, I'll answer one more time, maybe to give people a little more hope. Uh, um, <laughs> so look, if, if a manufacturer is on this call right now, you're probably the good guys, okay? So you're, you're probably in an upper echelon of manufacturing excellence because you're committed to these topics and these issues. And I would say, look, don't be afraid of transparency. Put issues out there, demonstrate to the world that you're managing these issues effectively. Look to work in partnership with uh, with your your factory with your buyers and in, in, in address these issues. And, and, and instead of just looking at this as an administrative uh, burden, look to to distinguish oneself in it. 
and I would say try and figure out a way to compete that's not based on price, uh, because you know you're you're not going to win. Always, someone's always going to be cheaper, and uh, and and the buyer, despite what they say, they care about price more than anything else. Okay, and that's me as the one who works for the buyers. I know it. Uh, the CSR people don't. The sustainability people don't. But the procurement people tend to put a focus on price above all else. And unfortunately, that's why you need enforcement uh, uh, and you need the ability to hold them accountable to to it, uh, to keep everybody honest uh, with that. Um, and so, but if factories can distinguish themselves by that value add, by additional performance, by, you know, all the all the things that leading manufacturers are able to do with fabric, with carbon reduction initiatives, with some of the, the things that that make uh, uh, more modern uh, uh, factories uh, distinguish themselves. I think uh, then you have a higher likelihood uh, that you're going to appeal to a higher brand uh, who who pays more respect to these issues than the uh, than maybe some of the more value brands or retailers who focus on, almost exclusively on price. And yeah, and, and we're back to purchasing practices. Um, and. And yeah, you know, and just as due diligence, you know, this this issue of due diligence, uh, you know, and I uh, understand what Jennifer said at the at the beginning. You know, there's a there's a history of this. This didn't just emerge out of nowhere uh, in the last shower. Um, but but this this conversation about due diligence has has been one of the hottest in the in the industry over the last eighteen months, along with purchasing practices. And I don't think there's any mistake that you know these two things are, are side by side on uh, on everybody's minds. Um, Jennifer, look, just one one last question here. Um, uh, Zishan has been waiting since five twenty eight p.m., uh, which is forty five minutes ago. Um, supply chain mapping includes uh, cotton suppliers, home textiles, apparel manufacturers. Will it include accessory suppliers too? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, unfortunately, we don't know exactly how far up the supply chain mapping is going to go, and we don't even know if it will be in the final. But what you can expect is that um, the EU legislation will, my expectation is that the EU legislation will at the most expect brands to look at three tiers, um, unless there's a really significant risk like a really significant risk. And this is where due diligence is a little different because it's it's based on where the severity of the issue is. So for example, if you have a huge risk at cotton, even if it's 15 business partners away, there is a chance that the legislation would want you to be able to map to that. Not all of your cotton producers, but those where there's a, a higher risk of, um, of child labor, for example, or worse forms of child labor. But we don't know yet. The first, so you'll know the the proposal from the commission is coming out in December, supposedly. So you, if you check back in December, um, <laughs> it might be pushed back. But right now they say December. Then you'll you'll have an answer to at least what they're thinking in terms of how far that mapping should go. Yeah, I, can I also comment on that one, just from the U.S. perspective? So yes. I think uh, I mean the U.S. Customs has basically sort of. Uh, uh, forced a lot of importers through the detentions, right? Because we're involved in about uh, 30 different detentions. Um, that, that means a U.S. company who gets a detention, that shipment can't go in, uh, and you have to prove that it was manufactured, you know, without forced labor and that. So a lot of brands and retailers need help with collecting all the documentation to prove it. And um, whether it be in apparel or whether it be in, in the solar industry, um, uh, because solar, you know, um, has a certain raw materials like polysilicone made in certain parts of China that people are concerned about. Um, anyway, it's incredibly hard. And what the U.S. Customs is asking is down to that raw material level, right? And even asking questions that uh, that would look at for the garment factory, the label. Where's the label from? Not just the garment, not the thread, not the button, the label, right? Uh, um, and, uh, and so I think we're seeing uh, um, some craziness in the kinds of questions that come in and demanding uh, that, that traceability really is incredibly robust. And, and the industry is not prepared for this at all. Uh, H&M is not prepared for this, actually. <laughs> and they're probably the best uh, in, in working on, one of the best in working on getting tier one, tier two figured out. But if you go down to that level of detail, uh, most uh, brands and retailers have not even come close to that. So uh, so I, I hope that the EU legislation doesn't go that far down 
uh, because I think then it will probably relate to just a, an empty uh, um, exercise that doesn't lead to real reform uh, because it's an impossible uh, uh, task to, to, to do that. And I'll just give you one example just to show you how impossible it is. We have one manufacturer that we work with that was fundamentally committed to actually do traceability. This is in the, in the solar industry. And they put 40 people, 40 people in an office in Shanghai for six weeks to trace just one shipment from the, the, the down all the way down to the raw material. And they still didn't do it. They still didn't do it. 40 people on it. So anyone talk about software and all this tracing software will help you in map one, map two, map three. No, 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 no. That's the easy stuff. The hard part is the verification that that purchase order matches that shipment and that shipment matches uh, this country of origin and all everything ticks and ties because it often doesn't. There are, there are, there are errors in all this data. Uh, uh, and so people hold up this panacea that blockchain will solve this. It doesn't. It's the actual data that comes in, which is too easy to find mistakes when you deal down to tier four, tier five levels uh, right. um, uh, in, in these complicated supply chains. This, this comes back to something, the, the very first point that, that Jennifer made. You know, you had five, Jennifer had five, yeah. uh, five things that she uh, wanted to you know, sort of just cover very quickly. The first one, which I wrote down and underlined, was demonstrate. Yeah. You know, under these new laws, Producers will need to be able to demonstrate that they have these systems, policies, and practices in place. And now is the time to start considering, uh, unless you want to end up like Ian's uh, solar panel manufacturer, which is a kind of a doomsday scenario. Um, yeah, you know, with forty people trying to trying to track back. Uh, solar panels are a little bit more complicated than. Than, a, than your shirt, right? But still, the the, the story holds uh, holds true. And I think this this demonstrate, be able to demonstrate, um, is going to is going to be something that that sorts out the um, the good from the not so good in in the in the manufacturing world. Mm. Um, I, I know I haven't got some questions. Um, Aaron's been uh, diligently typing questions into the chat box, and must feel like I am uh, ignoring him. Uh, but I'm I'm, I'm going to have to call it an issue there. But Aaron, the, the question about the purchasing versus the CSR team uh, is something that we're probably going to deal with an upcoming um, online seminar. It's a you know it, it, it's something that I think um, Ian's probably dealt with for for more than uh, for 20 years, and it's something that that I spent a lot of time on uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, so maybe there's a, a, an online seminar just on purchasing versus uh, CSR team, mm. et cetera. But we don't have time for that, and I'm very sorry. Um, I'm going to call now on uh, Lisa Ramoshoven to just wrap up things with a few uh, takeaways and, and learnings that, uh, that she got out of this. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks so much to uh, Ian, Alki, and also Jennifer for joining the panel today. And thanks so much for all the questions in the chat. I know we weren't able to answer all of them, uh, but we may follow up individually if there are some more resources we want to share. But thank you very much for um, these questions. I think they also uh, showed us that we can definitely if you do a few follow up webinars on some of those topics, as Stephen has already mentioned. And I just want to take this opportunity to quickly summarize a few of the points from today's input. I think it became very clear that uh, there are a few trends around mandatory due diligence that really need to be considered by all actors of the supply chains. One characteristic is that we are really moving away from voluntary movements and move more towards mandatory due diligence. And although the sector has faced many requirements in the past already, um, those often came out of niche laws and were covering some issues from some countries. But um, some actors have already been really good with covering a holistic approach in terms of their due diligence processes, 
but others really just tick the box and only follow through on those specific issues um, that were um, followed up on. But now that we see both the laws and many stakeholders move away from this fractal approach. And on the one hand side, we could see that there is more enforcement on existing laws. For example, Ian, you mentioned the US custom law that you know is not new, just the interpretation and the enforcement has really increased. On the other hand, we see that the number of laws has increased. Um, and also there is a number of laws that are planned and that we're very curious to see what will be coming out of the negotiations, for example, for the law of the European Union. But not just the number and the enforcement is changing, I think also the scope. So all actors really need to keep those like individual trends in mind and really proactively look into the risks that need to be monitored by their clients from Europe and the US. And while the assessments are new, not new, the fact that there are mitigation systems that need to be in place and they need to be communicated um, very clearly, that's an extension of what's been happening so far. And then if those systems fail, there also need to be need to be systems that effectively handle those disputes. And that may change the stakeholder dialogue and may move away from top down approaches to include other stakeholders and rather have an eye level conversation. Um, it may also lead to more sectoral approaches because otherwise all the different actors won't be able um, to negotiate and to deal with the, those different individual requirements and sectoral approaches really allow them to reduce the individual burden that will come out of those mechanisms. Um, I think if we look at industrial relations, ideally those get dealt with at factory level, of course. Um, but as two of you have been also saying, there needs to be an escalation path if that doesn't work. And this includes grievance mechanisms and individuals who do speak out need to be protected and covered by joint actions. And if those are credible, they also get used widely. Um, in addition to those actors that are, you know, directly impacted by um, in industrial relations or the brands, there's also, of course, the governments in the producing countries. And with this shift now towards more legislation coming from Europe, they can really position themselves as a producing market, accommodating those legislative frameworks. And I liked how Jennifer pointed out that there are some of those back presses practices, examples in the region already. Specific countries have already worked on some of those issues in a very um, strong detail. But of course, we still have seen many incidents and violations of due diligence that have happened in the past. And we will see whether those have contributed to bed better laws. And if those pay off, we will see in the future because a lot of this is conversation on future developments still. But we can already see that those laws increase litigation, increase court cases, and those brings an additional tool to those cases where preventative measures did not work. So I think if it really comes down to like the key facts right now, what I took away from this today is that yes, the requirements are increasing, but if we can come together for sectoral approaches, joint approaches and all sides proactively engage in those initiatives and try to look at a very holistic level, then ideally the individual burden that comes out of those legislations can be reduced. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, before I say farewell, um, I'd just like to remind you that uh, next week, uh, GIZ Fabric will be hosting part two of this, uh, of this uh, little series, um, focusing specifically on the German Due Diligence Act and consequences for Asian producers. And as I said earlier, 
uh, that act will come into force in January 2023. So uh, now is the time to start thinking about it. So uh, on behalf of GRZ Fabric, I would like to thank all of you for dialing in and perhaps more importantly in this digital age for staying online. Uh, your support is much appreciated. And thanks once again, of course, to our panelists, to Ian, to Jennifer and for Alke, who has uh, had something other important to do uh, and has left already, but uh, in her absence, uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, and that's all from me. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you thanks next all. time. Bye-bye.